What a powerful, powerful thought behind the song. And I'm grateful that the writer did not read through. I pray that wasn't me. Um, I pray, I, I'm grateful that the writer did not rush through, but uh, found a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil and wrote down those words because um, it had to come from his heart. It had to come from his heart. And because um, every time I sing it, it kind of rings true to my heart. Uh, I love to pray. Love to pray. But um, yet when I think how long it's been since I prayed the whole night through, I walked the fields behind the house, got on a glory road, and decided that I would not quit until uh, God was through. I've quit on God way too many times in my prayer. I'm grateful he never quit on me. But there's times that, uh, yeah, the, old, the old preachers used to talk about praying through. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You didn't, you, you, you didn't stop this side of finding glory. You prayed through. There's a discipline to that. There's, um, there's a reward of that. I think of um, Gethsemane when uh, the Bible says that Jesus went back and what, what, what blesses me is that it was not the eloquence of the words because it said that he went back and prayed the same thing, said the same words. It wasn't the words getting through, it was the blessing on his heart. Sometimes when our prayers we're trying to impress God with our words when we just need to open our heart. But I'm grateful when he does uh, meet us there. And um, I know Rick's going to Rick's gonna preach for me next Sunday night. I'm uh, going to have a little surgery this week. And uh, I am going to preach next Sunday morning, sitting in a chair. But I will be, can y'all just see that? We're going to. I need one of those swivel chairs, though. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm going to somehow get me a seat belt and put on that thing to keep me sitting. But uh, I'm supposed to keep my legs elevated. That's just not going to happen. So, uh, But I am going to repent enough to let Rick preach Sunday night. Well, let, I apologize, not let, be blessed. You will be blessed when Rick preaches Sunday night. I did not mean that sound that wasn't my heart brother don't first kings chapter 18 i'm gonna pray and we're gonna uh, look at one of the one of my favorite passages in the old testament and when i was preaching on sunday morning about the church triumphant i was going to preach chapter three and chapter four on the same sunday and y'all know that's next to impossible for me. So I only pre preached chapter 3 one week, chapter 4 the next week. But our guest who came, who needed to hear the message on chapter 4, heard it on that week. So that was, that was for them. And I'm not smart enough to do this, but today uh, I preach the end of chapter 4 and chapter 5 this morning. And really, this was planned way far ahead. And yet tonight, we're going to cover not the same material, but there is a certain subject in there that we're going to look at again. Whenever God does that, understand that God has a plan way beyond my plan. And when God amens himself, when God will amen the, the sermon from the sermon with uh, uh, the same word in a different way tonight, then there's something that God is saying, and I pray that his people will say amen to God and listen to that. And if it's oh me, that'll be fine too. But let's hear exactly what it is that God has to say. And before we look into 1 Kings 18, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And if you would, would you just stand with me? Um, I, I invite you. You can amen my prayer if you so choose, but take your heart to God and make sure that your heart is in tune with the Lord because we want every heart 
be one heart and one soul tonight. Can we do that? Let's put away everything else, and let's just come together as God's people. It's here on a, by the way, it's starting to sprinkle again. The showers of blessings are coming. But we'll let all that happen out there, and let's just get, let God do whatever he so chooses to do in here. Let's pray. Sir, I, I love you. I proclaim and declare that you are my God. There is no other. You have been with me. You spoke before I was your child. Lord, I know that there were times when uh, Satan wanted to sift me even before I became a Christian, but I thank you that your plan was greater and your call was on time. You're an on-time God. I thank you for what you did and have done in my life, and I pray, Lord, are doing in my life. Lord, I want to grow closer than I ever have been. I want my heart to be more true than it ever has been. I want the scales to fall from my eyes, Lord. I want, I want the chains to be taken off of my hands and my feet. I want my spirit to be released to you and to you alone, to be controlled by you and to control by you alone. I want the hunger for you like I never have had before. Father, I don't want to settle for, I don't want to settle for life. I don't want to settle for ministry. Lord, I want a, a life that will be seen in heaven and amen on earth. My Lord, you are God and I am not. It is your word, not my eloquence. It is your anointing, not my preaching. But Father, through the foolishness of preaching, through the foolishness of preaching, you by your spirit draw people to yourself. So I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing unto you. And Lord, that you will amplify that tonight by the anointing of your spirit as it speaks to every soul that is here to meet the need of every life, to encourage everyone in their walk. Father, that we could see afresh and anew what it is that you have for not just me, but for all of us, but for all of us individually as well. So Father, uh, as I've said many times, Jesus be Jesus. In this place, in this moment, in your word, and I pray, Lord, in my life. In your name I pray, amen. You can be seated. We met a man by the name of Elijah in 1 Kings 17. God found him in the most unlikely of places. He would have been forgotten by everyone else. As a matter of fact, no one would have ever noticed him at all except for the call of God on his life. And I know that there are a lot of people who have accomplished a lot of great things in this world, but they will all go by the wayside. They will all be forgotten. But if we could take our life and just yield it unto the Lord, then that God can actually do an eternal work in us. God can do something that lasts forever through us. That even everything, the greatest of everything in this world will fade away. But a life lived for the Lord, a life in touch with God, a life in time that can meet the eternal, the Alpha and the Omega, can come into this little parenthesis called the breath of life and do something unique, do something so powerful and so strong, something that has the, the fingerprint of God all over it that will last. Whether it be a burning bush or whether it be a donkey that speaks to Balaam or whether it will be a, a smooth stone taken out of the Jordan River in the floodplains when the children of Israel passed over to go over to the promised land, and that stone will be one of 12 stones to where a memorial for the people of God would remember what God could do. Elijah was such a man at such a moment who understood that God was great and God was powerful and God had a word and he would be used. Yes, even he could be used. And God took him from the most unknown places to the palace of the king because God had a word for Ahab. Nobody else may have been brave enough to do so, but, but Elijah was willing to say, thus saith the Lord. And then the most contrary thing that would happen, 
someone with such a word from God, with such boldness and a willingness to be used, was taken to the most obscure place where he would live by a brook and be fed by ravens. And the work of God began in his life, afresh and anew. And when he thought that he was humble, God took him one more step down and sent him to the pagan land where he would be provided for by a widow. And when he didn't think things could get any lower, even there he had his whole ministry challenged. But out of the challenge, he saw the power of God unveiled. And at the moment in time, the needed moment in time, God's right time, never early, never late, he comes and shows himself again to Obadiah. And to say, I'm back. And tell Ahab, I'm here. And it's time for us to talk. Obadiah was afraid. Ob Obadiah said, surely this will cost me my life. I'll go and tell Ahab that you're here. But God will take you away and then Ahab will kill me. Don't you know? That Jezebel's been killing the prophets of God, but I've hid 100 prophets in two caves, and I've fed them bread and water. I have taken care of God's anointed. But Elijah said to him, it's okay, it's all right, I'll be here. You tell Ahab, I'm here. It's time for something to happen. New Holland, I don't know why I say this other than my spirit groans within me, and I will say for such a time as this, it's time, New Holland, it's time for a work of God to be done afresh and anew. God's looking for someone weak enough that he can be strong enough to do a God work where he alone will get the honor and glory. So Elijah is there. Look in verse number 14, 1 Kings 18, verse 14. And now you say, go and tell my, your master, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of all lives, before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. So Obadiah, listen, this is a step of faith for him as well. All along in God's plan, it takes many people to walk the, step, the, the path of faith. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Isn't it funny how we can always blame others? Have y'all ever read the book? Uh, Dr. Henry Cloud wrote a book. Rick Townsend wrote a book called It's Not My Fault. If you've never read that book, find a copy of it. I'll give you a copy of it because I got a word for you. It is your fault. Amen? That was a perfect amen moment you let go by right there. For all of us that we want to say, I'm doing right, I'm doing well, all the things that are happening, it's not my fault. Look, it is my fault. And for every one of us, to, it, there is a culmination of everything that's been going on in life that's gotten us to this place. This, this is not just something that uniquely came up. And just as it's... It is my fault, and it's just that it is your fault. God knows that, and God is the answer to it. And God will look beyond our faults and find our needs, the need of this world, and the need that we have. I desperately need God to do a mighty move of God in my life, and I pray in your life as well. And Elijah was there. He answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, but you, your father's house have, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now here's the proclamation. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. It had been three and a half years without rain. Folks, how long was Jesus' ministry on earth? Three and a half years. To a culmination on a different hill. A showdown on a different hill. A hill called Calvary. Where God showed up strong. And life was changed. Tonight I, I'd like you to do something for me. 
God gave us this unbelievable thing inside our brain, not called mush. It is a conscience, and it's thought. And God gave us in our brain this thing called imagination. If I were to say to you a beautiful purple mountain's majesty, what do you see in your mind right now? You can see a picture of that. If I were to say to you a rocket ship flying through the sky, immediately you could picture that. If I could say to you a beach where the waves of God's love keep crashing in, time and time and in, endless, eternal, dot, 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 you could picture that, couldn't you? One of my sermons, lasting forever, you can picture that, can't you? I want you, if you would, to recognize that all of Israel was count was called to, to Mount Carmel. And I just would, if you could, just imagine yourself among one of the many that are there. You're close enough that you can hear the conversations, and you can see what is happening there that day. That's why God gave us this passage. He wanted us to be there. He wanted us to see not something that was a, a history lesson of something that happened all that time ago, but it's something that, that he wants us to experience. It's something that he wants to impact our lives here tonight. So if you can, can you see the mountain? Can you see yourself with all the others that are there? Can you see the excitement? Can you look around and you see the priest of Baal? dressed in their robes, looking very religious. You see the, the priest of, of the Asherah, and they're there with their responsibilities. You see Ahab there. If I look, I don't see Jezebel, though. Jezebel's not there. She's not interested. She doesn't care about this. But the king's there. There's so many people that are there. And Elijah says, come close. So let's gather up a little closer. And let's hear what it is he has to say. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter between two decisions? How long? You're commingled. You know what's right. You know the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Israel. You know Jehovah God. We are God's chosen people. And yet, here are these ten tribes of the north called Israel. From Jeroboam down, we've been following these people. We've let them take us a long way down a, a dead-end road. And you've allowed it to happen in your life. Others may be at fault. Others may have had a negative influence on your life. Others may have let you down. New Holland, there may have been a preacher in your life that let you down. There may have been a parent in your life that didn't set the right example. There may have been a school teacher who said something to you that, that ruined you and hurt you and bruised you. There may have been others who said that, that you were a nobody, but God told you that he loved you with an everlasting love. And that he came and he let his son die on the cross of Calvary. And there may have been a time in your life that you knew that you had a need and you felt like you had to choose God, and you did, and you gave him your heart, and you gave him your life, and you gave him your eternity, and you meant it, and things were good for a while, but the waves of the world have kind of weighed in against you. And you've fallen back into a pattern, very serious pattern, very scary pattern. You may have found yourself in a place where you've lost the joy of your salvation. You've lost the significance of prayer. You've lost what it means to have a time with God. 
I pray you're not hearing just another sermon. Can you, can you see Elijah as he says, how long? How long will we continue this? For all these years, this has been happening, and this is what has gotten us to this place. Look at our city and our county and our world. It didn't happen overnight. But church, what about us? How long will we falter between two decisions? Truly, we could say, if the Lord is God, serve Him. If not, let's not waste our time. He says, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. That's a deathly quiet. They didn't know what to say, Brother Rick. They were embarrassed. I really believe that somewhere down in here, they knew that they were walking a guilty distance away. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left of the prophets of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, here's the showdown. Let them give us two bulls. Let them choose one bull for themselves. Cut it in pieces. Lay it on the wood. Put no fire under it. I will prepare the other bull. Lay it on the wood. And put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods. Gods, plural. Big gods, little god, all the little gods that you have. And I will call on the name of the Lord. The Lord. King of kings, master, Jehovah God. And the God who answers by fire. He is God. Now I love this next phrase because this was not just King Ahab. It says, so all the people answered and said, well spoken. All the people said, that's right. Maybe we have been faltering on two opinions for too long. Maybe we have been both trying to have our left and our right, the ways of the world and the ways of Jehovah. Maybe we have tried to commingle this too much on our own. But now, let's just see. Let's see what happens. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourself and prepare it first. For you are many and call on the name of your God. Put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, verse 26, they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, about three hours, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. Does God, the God that you pray to, does he hear your prayers? And there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. You see, that's emotion. What we try to do when we have no answers, we try to add the emotion to it. Emotions are a God-given gift. They're there. We wouldn't have joy if we didn't have our emotions. We wouldn't have laughter, but we also would not have sadness. It depends on the circumstances. But listen to me. When it comes to God, it's not simply your feelings. It's fact. And the facts should direct your feelings, not your feelings trying to become fact. So they begin to leap around and leap around. You can see all these things happening. But le listen, can you see them? Are you watching? They're praying. They're shouting. They're jumping around. But not one thing is happening. Verse 27, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them. See, I'm not the only one with the spiritual gift of being a smart aleck. He mocks them and says, cry aloud, for he is God. Either he's meditating or he, maybe he's busy or he is on a journey or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. I mean, he's trying to needle him a little bit, right? So evidently it worked. Verse 28, they cried aloud. Now hold on, hold on here. When the leaping and the crying out didn't work, they got to get a little bit more serious in their eyes. Verse 28 says, And they cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. I don't know how many of y'all have ever met someone that today is trying to cover up their pain 
and they cut themselves. I have. I've seen the scars. I've been there. The God that I know is a God of love. God doesn't look for us to punish ourselves. Just repent. We're not going to get his attention by mutilation. When midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening offering. There was, look at it, no voice, no one answered. Look at these last words of verse 29. No one paid attention. I have a word for that. Nonsense. Futility. A waste. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So let's walk a little closer. The 450 prophets of Baal have moved aside. The, four, the 400 prophets of Asher have moved away. And now we're, we can creep in a little closer, and it's just the one prophet, the one man of God, and he is there. Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and it says, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. I think he went. Maybe there was an old altar. Time had probably slipped by on it a little bit. It had probably been abandoned for quite a while. A place where offerings were made to Jehovah God. But he finds an old altar there. Listen. And he begins to repair it. I wonder about the altars in our own life. Maybe that They've been left alone. Maybe the prayer altar. I preached this sermon or something like this on this scripture one time and my wife looked at me and said, what about our family altar? What about our family altar? We have altars in our life, folks. Have they been a left to abandonment? In disrepair. You know, there's some beautiful homes across our countryside. We live here in the house in the south. And, and and these homes were probably the most beautiful in all the countryside, but yet we look at them now and they're empty and they look like if you sneezed real hard, they'd fall over. The only ones that live there are the spiders. And you look at those things and you say, one time, one day, that was a mighty house. But you look at it now and you say, I wouldn't live there for anything. How long has it been? He went and found the old altar. He began to get the bottom layers of the wood, Ed, put them back together, straighten them out, get the next layer of wood, put it on straight, lay the next long lumber there and get it ready. Get the stones of the base. Let's put them in the proper order once again. God told Moses how to do this. He recorded it. Listen, he didn't try anything new. The things that we have that are the fundamentals of the faith, we don't walk away from, and we don't need to reinvent. We just need to get back to. Prayer is as old as the Garden of Eden. The Word of God spoke in Genesis 1, and I pray it still speaks today. It does in my life. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Verse 31, Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. God has a purpose for everything that he does. To whom the Word of the Lord has come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Do you think those watching saw those 12 stones? Brother Mark, I've often wondered if he hummed a hymn. I've often wondered as he was doing his work, if he had a song on his heart. Maybe Psalms 23, I don't know. Maybe Psalms 2 or Psalm 68. But he's putting it back together for a reason and a purpose. The altar needs to be rebuilt. 
Then the, with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seahs of seed. I guess everybody's there going, hold on. What in the world is he doing now? He's dig digging this big trench around it. And he's not telling everybody. Jim Mills will be saying, he's not supposed to do it like that. Can I get an amen? i never seen it that way before. Brother Broadus says, I wonder what he's doing. He just keeps humming, keeps doing his work. Verse 33, he put the wood in order, in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood, and said, fill four water pots with water. Church, listen to me. If you want God to do a work, I hope you're listening. It needs to be a God work. It needs to be a God work. So he said, fill the water pots. He takes the bull and lays it out there. What was the most precious thing, the most precious commodity that you have after a three and a half year drought? Take the water and pour it on the altar. Can you, is, is your throat a little dry just thinking about it? As he's pouring it out? Church, the most precious thing you have needs to be Christ. And anything else needs to be poured out on the altar of the Lord. I don't know what you're holding more closely to your heart. I don't even care if it's family. You want to argue with me? Don't argue with me. Go back into Genesis and talk to Abraham about it. Isn't it funny? Abraham had to take even his family and lay it on the altar before the Lord. I've had to do this in my life. I will not stand between Someone in God. I want God to be God and I am not. And the most precious thing you have has to go. Pour it out before the Lord. When Mary came before Christ in Bethany, when she was going to anoint him for his burial before the cross, she took the alabaster box and she broke it open and she poured it all out. Judas made much of the cost. Mary made much of worship. Mary did not see that as loss and neither should we. There are things that we're holding closer to our heart than God and God says, please allow me to be Lord of all. Fill the four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Verse 34, he said, do it a second time. They did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. Now they've got a soaking wet altar. And you can see around it that, that ditch that was dug, filled with water. God is looking to do a God-sized work in our life, not a man-sized activity. And folks, wet wood won't burn. Y'all good with that? But the God who will answer by fire, he's not deterred by a little wet wood. But I wonder how many people that are there, if you were around that, that altar on Mount Carmel that day, and you saw the water being poured over once, twice, three times. I wonder how many of you when your heart was saying, he has just ruined any chance that he had. Sometimes God is looking for us that by faith, we need to walk out on an impossibility, an impossibility for God to be God. I wonder if we're, if we're trying to hedge our bet a little bit 
But I tell you what, when Peter got out of the boat and began walking on the water, he wasn't looking to hedge his bet. He was looking to go to Christ. And in our walk, if we're going to be different, we're going to not have to hedge our bet. If we're going to be different, if we're going to have a God work in our life, then we need to have no crutches other than him. Let's put the wet wood out there. Let's put the impossible and make it a him possible, only possible through him. So the water ran around the altar and he filled the trench with water and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came and near and said, folks, he's going to pray a prayer. Not like my prayers. He just got to the heart of the matter. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, he's reminding them who he's praying to. And I believe around that, al that altar, all the people, their, their heart's doing this now. Lord God, Jehovah, let it be known this day <laughs> that you are God in Israel. And I am your servant. And then I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this people may know, that this people may know. The word know means not just an intellectual understanding. We got way too much of that. But this means that an experiential know. We don't have near enough of that. You may know what thus saith the Lord in the book, but do you have a testimony of what thus saith the Lord in your life? Have you experienced the miracle of God that can only be explained by him? Have you experienced the joy of not having any other altars before the Lord except the Lord God? He says that this people may know that you are the Lord God. By the way, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. I believe with all my heart that this must be a God work. It can't be a preacher job. It can't be, brother, Mark, it can't be you doing it. I don't have the power and you don't have the power. New Holland, please hear me. You, there's some dearly beloved people in this building. There's some good people with good lives. But I don't care how good you are, your righteousness is not enough. It's not. Your motives, they may be pure. It's not enough. If it's a God work, we're going to have to look for God to do it. And if he doesn't do it, we don't have any hope. But this book tells us that he can. And he will. So he says that you have turned their hearts back to you again. I think if you uh, timed me, and I read verse 36 and 37, it could be done in a matter of seconds. But after this sincere prayer, the man of God backed up, didn't he? He backed up because he knew with belief what God was about to do. Verse 38 said, Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, licked up the water that was in the trench, and when all the people saw it, what's it say? That can only mean humble worship. The word worship in the Bible means to bow down. <laughs> With no prompting from the worship director, 
<laughs> Without any altar calls from the preacher, all God's people said, Amen, and fell on their face before the Lord. <laughs> and they said, The Lord, <laughs> He is God. The Lord, He is God. Church, the world is waiting for us to get back to the place where we would fall on our face before Him and say, The Lord, He is God. No, nothing else matters. Nothing else is as important. He is the God that will sustain us throughout all of eternity. He is the God that's bigger than any problem. He is the God that's bigger than anything that you think is so important in your life. He is greater. He can bring balance. He can bring blessing. He will pour out his love. He can change more in a few moments than we could in a life. That's the God that we serve. El Shaddai, God Almighty. And there is no other. The gods of this world will fade away. The things of value will fall apart. Relationships, the only thing you're going to carry to heaven is what you carry with you in souls. Everything else won't matter. Our investment as a church, we will be seen as, a, as a, a mighty church of God, the church triumphant, by how we give ourselves in, in, in souls, how we minister under life, not death, and how we yield to the work that God wants to do us. Listen, in us, with us, through us, every day. What a God we serve. What a magnificent God. Can you see yourself on that mountain? Can you see yourself falling down on your face before Jehovah God? I want to go back to the song we sang before we started. How long has it been since you fell on your face? How long has it been since you got down by your bed and stayed the whole night through? How long has it been since tears could not be controlled because you did have to yield and surrender what meant more to you than life and breath? We serve a God who can. We serve a God who will. We serve a God of love. It had been generations. I wished I had counted. I, I should have. I should have gone back and looked at all the generations from Jeroboam. His line was done, the next line was done, and the third line was done. Janice, your Sunday school class, studied the kings, went through 1 Kings. All the foolishness, all the vanity, all the nothingness. But then, in God's moment, in God's time with God's people, God's man, God's word, he changed it all. He changed it all. We desperately need the Lord, not just New Holland. We tried everything else. Maybe we just need to repair the old altars, Brother Bradley. Let's bow our heads right now. Heads bowed. Father, I know I've spoke probably too long. Lord, you can say more in seconds. So speak to hearts even now. May we hear your invitation. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will hear from us tonight. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven in my life like it was in Elijah's to the glory of God and God alone Father I don't know what all you're going to be doing in our lives I don't know what you're going to be doing in our city and I thank you oh God for the work that you're doing in many places I thank you oh Lord that there are people that are crying out to you and that you hear their voice Father I just pray that you'll do a work in my life and Lord for as many as would call upon your name thy will be done oh Lord Let it be quiet for just a moment with your heart to God. Speak to him whatever it is you want to say.